Hi, it's Sue Greenwald with Awakened Stories. Welcome to part two of the interview I did with David Adair, and we're not done yet. In part two, we talk a little bit more about David's rocket and what happens at Area 51. He was basically forced uh, to blow up his own rocket, which was really the love of his life in a way. You know, it was his life's work at that point, and he was only 17. And he walked out of Area 51 with Pithalum, the entity inside of him. He was called the lifeboat. So that's pretty exciting and unique. And as he graduated from high school, that very day he was abducted and drafted into the army. They did torture him for a few days. And then again, serendipity, beautiful coincidence, led him to changing his station, upgrading his experiences. And he's just done so many interesting things. So welcome to part two. Take care. So why don't we fast forward, like you're 17, you've built the rocket Pithalum. We'll skip that story. The rocket ended up being blown up by yourself on purpose. But that led to a story of how you met Pithalum, Pithalum the entity, or I don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> well, she was with me when I had to blow my rocket up. Yeah. And she was not prepared for that. She... She wasn't prepared for the emotional condition that I went through. She wasn't ready for that. She thought it was going to be an easy ride. She didn't, in their world, they don't know what tears are. Well, they do now. Mm -hmm. And she had to learn a lot of stuff. But um, yeah, I get up, um, we get up to the surface. I got pistol in me. And my other pistols out there with in the wind blowing with the parachutes and everything. And um, so I'm thinking, how am I going to destroy that rocket engine? Because if I don't do it, they're going to have a prototype and they'll, they'll, they'll go on with first strike. So I start whining and crying and I knew that would bother Rudolph and it did. And I leaned against the hangar doors and slid down, making all kinds of noise whining and crying and I scooped out a lump of graphite grease out of the hub of the wheel of the door and Rudolph had enough of my noise so he told the guards take him out there to see his rocket so they put me in that personnel carrier and we went riding out there and I told the guards to stay back because it may leak and these things don't leak not designed that way. But they were more than happy to stay back away from it. So I went over there to it and I opened up the induction chamber and introduced um, graphite grease into it with deuterium. Ask any physicists what happens under superheated conditions when that thing fires up and cyclotrons out. It's going to be a violent explosion. So I told the guards, we got to leave. This thing's leaking. And it wasn't leaking. I've set it on a timer. It's, it's going to self-detonate. And when I was sitting there doing that, and I closed the door, and I'm looking at the whole thing laying there, and I thought, God, I'm going to miss this thing. And um, it was such a part of my life. And it was really difficult. Uh, how would you like to take your five-year-old daughter put her head against you and put a gun on her forehead and pull the hammer back you're going to have to kill your child if you don't two billion people are going to vaporize but you created this thing from scratch it's part of your heart and soul and so when i slid that induction chamber back i looked at it and thought i wish you could just fly away and never come back. But it's going to go. And it did. So we get back in that damn personnel carrier. And he's scooting across the desert. And then they asked me a question I really didn't think about. I was thinking about the loss I'm going to experience. But he said, what's a safe distance? And I thought, oh, God. 
I'm thinking that this thing's going to be a conventional explosion. What if it goes nuclear? And I looked at the guard and I said, Chicago? <laughs> he goes, oh, God. <laughs> he floors it then, and uh, we make it back up to the hangar just in time for it to detonate. And boy, it fortunately, it stayed conventional. And uh, <laughs> I would have blown the Area 51. Area 51 would have been history. So I told it, um, I looked at it and it's gone. And uh, Rudolph is really smart. He looks at the guards and he says, what happened? He said it was leaking. So he looks at me, walks over to me, grabs my hands and turns them around, sees the graphite grease. And then he looks at the hangar door, see how fast he is? And he looked at me and he said, very smart. He said, that's going to cost you your rest of your life here. So he was going to keep me at Area 51 forever. I was never going to get out of there. And I thought, damn, what the hell of a place to end up. So they take me to this room where we went across, um, went by a bunch of offices, women working on payroll. Just life going on, man. Like nothing happened. This is after the rocket has exploded. Yeah. You haven't really told that story, but like they're just doing their thing. Yeah. Everybody's just like, yeah. it's normal days at Area 51. Something's always blowing up somewhere. <laughs> and um, so they just doing payroll and I thought, God almighty. So they take me to this room, no windows, one door, one light bulb hanging from the ceiling by wire. And they throw me in and um, slam the door shut. Um, and I was a mess because um, Rudolph had hit me. When he saw the graphite grease on my hands in the door, he just really belted me a good one. It hit me so hard, my bottom teeth came through my lower lip. I still have a scar on the inside. And um, so I'm bleeding all down my front. And they threw me in that room, and I feel like I was there for three days, but I guess I was only there maybe five or six hours. And I hear this noise out in the hallway, people cussing, one big per voice booming on everything. I said, damn, that sounds familiar. So the door flies open, and there's a big frame in the doorway with a hat on with the doing a stogie like this. I went, oh, God, that's, that's only one person I know. That's Curtis LeMay. And he's got his, he's got this tie wrapped around his hand that belongs to the colonel of Area 51, the base commander. And he's banging him from wall to wall. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't know this, guess who appointed those people at Area 51? The chief of the Joint Chiefs, Curtis LeMay. So they are jumping at his parking and he's demanding to know where he looks at me and he turns around to that colonel, colonel said, oh God, we didn't do that. He said, Rudolph did that. Where is Rudolph? Right. Him. He said, he left, got in a jet and left. He said, get him cleaned up and put him on my jet. And that's how I got out of there. I think LeMay liked me. Right. Well, I think he did too. Um, he saw your potential, but he also rescued you, I think, twice, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, both times he, I think he disliked me, but he told me, he said, um, he didn't know I was going to go in the military. Well, God, what a career I had there. Yeah. But he thought I, uh, he said, um, he thought I was, I forgot the word he used. I was just like them. I was like a prototype, younger prototype of, of a soldier that should be. God, little did he know how, what I would become. It was his direct intervention because the second time he showed up was at Langley, home of the CIA. And um, what happened was... Um, 
he took me home on his private jet, and it was a nice jet. I think it was a. I can't remember the name of it. Um, but it's a pretty jet. So we get there at about one o'clock in the morning uh, at Dayton, Ohio, at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Then his limo and driver take me on to my home about an hour and a half away by car. And they let me out. And um <laughs> I remember him telling me in the back of the limo that he said, I'm going to erase our paper trail as best I can. He said, they should leave you alone, but I got a feeling Rudolph and company is not through with you. So the best thing you can do is never build another rocket the rest of your life. And that kind of stung. So I got out and I went into my house. Some parents, everybody had seen me. And, um, so <laughs> I go to school the next day and remember the English literature teacher asked, well, write a dissertation. What did you do for your summer vacation? I thought, <laughs> God almighty. I'm sitting there going, well, let's see. And I said, forget it. I'm, I worked at Pizza Hut. That's all I said. <laughs> I wasn't about to tell him what all the hell went on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was right. Well, May was right. It was quiet in the winter, quiet in the spring. And then summer came and we're graduating. And uh, I'm shaking hands of the parents because I had my cap and gown on with everybody else. We're saying goodbye or whatever. And I, I'm telling the parents, yes, I have a full scholarship to Ohio State University Theoretical Astrophysics. So um, I shaking parents' hands and I grab this hand over here to my left and it's ice cold, ice cold. It's 95 degrees and it's ice cold. And I look at it and it's like two guys in black suits with mirror sunglasses. They hand me this letter. So I open, I step back out of the line. I'm behind everybody and I'm reading the letter and it says, greetings, I'm drafted. There is no OSU for me. So they grab me and they drag me over to the station wagon and throw me in. My parents are yelling. My classmates saw that and they asked, what the hell happened to you? You disappeared right after that. We never saw you again around town, nothing. I said, well, I was um, past catching up with me, I guess. That's horrible. Uh, horrible. So, they threw me in a station wagon, a blue station wagon, remember that. And they take me to Port Columbus, the airport of Columbus, Ohio. And they go to MAT, Military Air Transport, MAT. So I'm at the MAT terminal, and I'm standing there. And here comes a, a, another private jet pulls up, out steps Rudolph and the guys in the black suits and mirror sunglasses, the whole thing. It must be like uniforms for them. So they told me to get in the jet. Well, I start to get in the jet, and then this truck pulls up. It's a military personnel carrier. And out jumps about 25 blue berets, special forces, and out steps Colonel Williams. And they all get down into a firing position and they're cocking their guns. Now the guys with the private jet, they have pulled out all these things called Mac 10s. And um they're they're it's gonna be a major firefight right now, right here, right now. And I'm looking both sides and not backing down. I'm in between them and I just walked over to Colonel uh Bell and told him I said uh, Colonel, um, let me get in the jet and go with these guys in the suits. I want everybody to go home to their families, their kids and everything. There's no reason because it looks like it's going to be a, I said, I, those MAC-10s they've got, they fire 35 rounds every five seconds. Somebody's going to die here, a lot of you. I said, just let me go. Tell them, hey, thanks, but just let me go. So 
I got on a jet, and an hour later, I was in Langley, Virginia. So uh, I'm in this hospital room type room. Door opens up, and in walks Arthur Rudolph and his friends in the white coats, pushing tables, all kinds of damn fun things on the table, needles, scalpels, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh boy, it's gonna be fun. <laughs> Revenge. So, yeah, yeah, so we we get in a fight. I get in a fight. Chairs are flying, furniture's flying, and. Uh, I remember being stripped, butt naked, thrown on a stainless steel table. Boy, that thing's cold. And then they strap you down. And then I felt the needle going to my right, my right top hand. It was like liquid fire coming up my arm. And I got introduced to the tall family. Sodium barbitol, sodium pentothal, all the thals. And, um, there were some others, but he had a whole, a whole rack full of them. And, um, you know, I'm not supposed to be under for more than two hours with the stuff. And I was under three days. And I remember waking up in somewhere along the line, 12, 14 hours into it. And one of the assistants said, we can't give him any more, Dr. Rudolph. He'll be a an eggplant, a vegetable. And he said, I don't give a fuck. Hit him with it. And they I went out again. So I came through it all okay. Um, I thought I did. Until one day I discovered something. I was, I looked at my, my old notebook. I was packing up because I was going to the military. And I tried, I remember writing it. It's in my handwriting. I remember it going on the page. I can't read it. It's beyond me. So my higher upper functions have been burned out by all the sodium thals, all the pentathols. So isn't that strange? Here you are in 1971 and a colonel of the Gestapo still taking shit from you. Yeah. So, so people... Um, that are watching this might not know about Operation Paperclip, all right? So right. what happened is, well, I don't know the year or anything, but basically we took all the German scientists and the, the rocket scientists and all that and integrated them into our own society. Yeah, that happened in 1945. Yeah, that's... Um, 44, they, they defected. And what happened was out of Pina Monday where they were building the B-2 rockets, the German scientists, through these forces, whatever they are, they separated almost equal. 100, 120 went to uh, America and 125 went to Soviet Union. And that birthed both of the superpower space programs simultaneously. That's where it came from. Right. started right then. And um, <laughs> Bob Braun said... And what else could you say? He said, we got the better half. <laughs> but so, we, we yeah, so that's together. where he came from. This is where Rudolph came from and all sorts of other right. people, right? And yeah. May have had their own agendas that we're not aware of. Right. They were put to work. What they did, our government put the 125 scientists in a school bus, a couple of school buses. They came across the southern border, and they were blue eyed, blonde hair Mexicans with green cards. And they came into New Mexico, and that's where they started the bumper program, which is all the B 2 rockets we confiscated. And we picked up right where they left off. And that's how we got our space program underway. Right. And they lived in these Quonset huts out in the desert. And there's another story I don't bother telling, but it's a great story. I'm going to write a book. And it's going to, it's going to be entitled "Hot Rods of Nevada," because what these German scientists did—they were bored, so they worked on American cars, and they created all this shit on these American cars and fixed them way better. 
and a lot of the patents went back to Detroit. But they would race each other in these hot rods of Nevada. And I thought, what a great story, what a movie that would make. But they invented a lot of things. They had where the headlights would turn with the steering wheel. Wow, oh, yeah. You know, just kind of really smart, common sense stuff. Yeah. And um, a lot of our stuff came from there. Um, you know, stuff that automatic transmissions, um, power steering, power brakes, um, all that stuff. And uh, Detroit takes all the credit for it. Um, so it's um, nothing unusual. It's the same old stuff. But yeah, yeah. Anyway. Well, I was going to say, let's, let's back up as long as we're telling the story. Do you want to back up and talk about eight, from age 17 when you had the Pithalum rocket? We we ended where your mom told you the dream. All right. Yeah. And then to where you actually ended up at Area 51 and had to blow it up. Like, since we're kind of telling the story, may as well tell it all, right? Because yeah, that's a um, big chunk of it. And then we'll come back up to where you were, like, forced into the military. Okay. What happened was... um. Uh, they told me to land my rocket out of White Sands Proving Grounds 456 miles northwest in a place called Groom Lake, Nevada. And I said, why are we going so far away? I can drop it right down on top of us. We don't have to go anywhere. And now we're skipping some things. Um, it's when we had the rocket <laughs> the day before we took the rocket out to the pad Rudolph was in there. He got off the damn jet with the guys in the black suits, mirror sunglasses, and he's wearing a little khaki outfit. Kind of looked like Marlon Perkins. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so I, I looked at it and I said, where's the bunny head on the black jet? You know, Hugh Hefner had a black DC-9 had a bunny head painted on the tail. And um, I noticed Rudolph, or not Rudolph, but Colonel Williams failed to laugh. I said, what's wrong with Colonel Williams? He goes, see that guy in a khaki outfit? Yeah, we are in enormous trouble. He said, I got to go make a call. He disappeared. Well, he goes call. He goes and calls Curtis LeMay, who's back at Wright-Patterson. And he hears what's going on. He said, you know, Rudolph showed up. He's going to take over. So Rudolph comes up to me. I'm standing there in a hangar. The rocket's right next to me, behind me. He said, who are you? I said, oh, I'm just a kid that builds rockets in Calfields. I said, who are you? And he says, I know who he is. Von Bon Braun showed me a picture of him. But he doesn't know I know. So he says, oh, I'm just a guy that checks out technologies for the military. Okay. He said, what's that behind you? I said, that's my rocket. He said, let's have a look at it. So I walk over to it. I take this big bar of metal I have in my hand. I slide it down the hall. And almost miraculously, scenes show up and the door slides back. And he goes, what is that? I said, it's called a dissimilar metal lock. It's old technology. It's from Shape, you ever heard of Shape? Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, where you guys confiscated uh, all the technology off the Germans and brought it in. We don't know where this thing came from, but it's kind of cool. It's called Dissimilar Metal Lock. And um, he was annoyed by that. I don't know why. Uh, come to find out later why. Then he bends over and looks down in the at the rocket engine, and I. He's on one side of the rocket, I'm on the other. And when he sticks his head in, I put my head right down by his head. And I say right in his ear, Dr. Rudolph, this engine's got 10,000 times the power of your F-1 Saturn V engine. <laughs> and he raises up and he looks at me and goes, who are you? I'm just a kid that flies rockets in Calfields. And he was annoyed that I had such an advanced engine. He didn't understand how a Midwest uh, 
kid from Ohio could have circumvented past all of the German rocket scientists and everybody else on the planet. And that was a good question, isn't it? Yeah, I wasn't going to take the hours to explain it all. But <laughs> he just um, was annoyed by it really bad. And um, he started, his attitude turned nasty to me. And uh, if I didn't know better, I think he was jealous. Yeah. I swear. Yeah. I think he really was. And um, I don't know why. You know, he's the one that got the most distinguished award. You know, NASA didn't even know I existed. And um, so anyway, uh, we load up the rocket and put it on the pad next day. And that's where the fun starts. Yes, we're getting ready to launch this thing. So we're standing there in the blockhouse. We're at the last, I can't remember the name, block 31, I think. We're at the very end of the blockhouse. This was the last one that we see straight on out. And about another three miles away is Pistol sitting there. The, the rocket. Yeah, and it's on the pad and it's it's heating up and it's getting ready to turn its internal power on. So we hear everybody on the control room saying, inertia systems are complete, you know, internal power is now, you know, engaged. So it's on its own now. And that's when Colonel Williams just decided to ask me a question. He said, David, I know we've been busy running here and there and everything. When did you have time to test the fields? The ability of the fields that will hold. I said, I haven't. This is it. This is the test. Either those fields hold or you and I see this big flat wall behind us. Do a jumping jack. You're going to make the coolest shadow you've ever seen on that thing. And so Kurt Wayne goes, oh, my God. <laughs> he, hit, he hits the red button. And the red button goes off. The alarms are going off. But nothing, um, you know, it's too late. The rocket is now already internal power. It's on its own. And so now Rudolph is really interested in what the hell's going on because he understands what's happened and what the question was. Fortunately, everybody else at their controls just stayed normal because they didn't understand what field containment meant. But Rudolph and Williams did. And um, so I said, um, well, get ready to do a jumping jack. You know, <laughs> let's make a neat shadow. And we look out the window and the observation people goes, what's happening out there? Well, there's this flames are roaring. And the flames go from reddish orange to a bluish white to clear. And it's, everything's distorted. And then there's just this massive explosion. And they thought my rocket blew up because they didn't see anything leave. And I said, no, just hold on a minute. I'm counting seconds. Red phone rings. Red phone is a direct line to NORAD, North American Air Defense Command. And they are calling, and this guy is loud. You can hear him over the damn phone. He said, what the hell have y'all done over there? He said, well, we had a civilian rocket blow up. Blow up hell. We got it on the on the scopes over here. That thing has done traveled 130 miles in 3.2 seconds. What is that? There is no, there's nothing known on Earth that moves that fast. There's a new type of engine this kid built. He goes, a kid? <laughs> y'all drinking over there what the hell are you talking about and he said um, this teenager brought this rocket in and they launched it and it's just he said do you see where it's going next and I said it's at apogee see in rocket flight you have perigee which is the lowest curve of the point apogee is at the very top what we call zenith point and he said do you see where the zenith point is yeah you know where it's headed? It sure do. Okay. Well, we'll just we'll just track it. So it's heading for a place called Groom Lake, Nevada. So I'm told to go out there and get on that DC-9 and go with Rudolph. I said, we're going out to Groom Lake, Nevada. 
Do you see the tires under your damn jet? That thing's gonna belly up to its belly in dirt and dust, and we'll never get out of there. So I said, um, um, okay. He says, get on board. So I do, and I'm looking at my maps, all my GSP maps and the government maps and everything, and there's nothing there. It just says it has a dry lake bed. So I thought, what the hell's wrong with these people? <laughs> so we, uh, after some flight time, we get there. We pull up on a huge base in the bottom of this valley. And um, we fly over these mountain ridges, which I think they call Government Ridge or something like that. And um, anyway, there's a whole base that sits down this valley and it's got these huge runways 10,000 feet runways two of them they're being staked out they're not through yet we're landing on the taxiways taxiways are enormous you know plenty big so I thought what the hell is this place look on the map it says nothing nothing there so but apparently Rudolph knew it was there. He's all at home. And um, so that was Area 51. So we land. We taxi over to these three hangars. We stop at the one in the middle. And then out comes this damn thing from George Jetson. Looks like it's a personnel carrier. It's really weird looking. And um, the way the seats are... <coughs> <clears throat> three of the bench seats face forward this last set of bench seats face out the other way so I go sit in the back seat and see he's getting out of everybody else climbs in those seats and sit down and um, that's very important because see we're going down through the causeway well first we drive into the hangar and we stop and all these chains come up out of the floor and make like a little guardrail type thing. And then the whole floor drops down. And I mean, this floor is enormous. It's all concrete. And it's it's got to be the size of a gymnasium or bigger. And I thought, God almighty. Can you imagine the weight of this concrete floor plus the weight of aircrafts on top of it? How much weight are they moving here? Well, we get down. And after we get down about... 50 feet. Then we see what's. I said, they can't be using chains or cables. Won't hold it. As these giant worm screws in the walls that have turned, there's the size of sequoia trees. Think how big a sequoia is. Giant. Yeah. And there's 12 of them. And I thought, my God, that's a, uh, that is a turn screw. I said, that's the uh, heaviest load-bearing thing we know of. Um, you find it in lipstick cases. When they turn it, the lipstick comes out. Right. The same thing. A garage door fastener is the same thing. Uh, it's a worm screw. The most powerful thing we know to lift up. So whatever they're moving around here, it's heavy. Really heavy. So... Um, we dropped down about 200 feet, I would estimate, and the floor of the of the hangar flushes out at the bottom. Got three walls on us, and then the, the one-fourth wall is not there. You look straight ahead, and man, there is a cavern down there they have built. And it's like a rainbow-shaped roof. It comes down to the sides and then stops and goes straight down to be perpendicular. And um, I'm looking at it, and it goes so far, you can't see the end of it, and you see the curvature of the Earth. Now, in Navy, when you go from horizon to horizon on an ocean, we know that span is 20 miles. So I am looking at a corridor that's been bored out through this desert floor for over 20 miles. And I knew that much. And um, I 
asked them a simple question. They got all pissed off. I said, what did y'all do with all the dirt? Because there's no dirt upstairs piled up anywhere. What did you do with it all? I'm not kidding. I want to know. And um, they got annoyed by that. So don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, I thought, well, how much you need a phaser cannon or something? Because there's no dirt anywhere. So we take off driving down through there. And it's wide. I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's probably 150 feet wide. And then about another 75 feet high up to the point of the curvature of the dome. And then these walls that ran perpendicular were huge. And they had hangar doors on them. And not all the doors, the doors were pulled shut, but they weren't butted up to each other. They were split about 10 feet between each of them. Maybe the circulation thing or something, I don't know. But when we're driving by, I could look through and see in these work areas. Uh, there's things I ain't never seen. First thing I saw was a um, XB-70. Now, there isn't supposed to be any more. One crash and deader, one sent to the museum. What is this one sitting there? And I think there's more than one. But sitting behind the XB-70 gets even better. There's this huge tear-shaped draw uh craft sitting there. It's got a window that's in the fuselage. It's self-flush with the fuselage. And there are two smaller teardrop ships underneath it. They look like they could just crawl up inside it. So from what I've listened to people describe things, that looked like a mothership with UFOs underneath it. But these things are not static displays. They got air conditioner hoses running to them. They got power cables running to them. They got drip pans under them. These things are actually working. And um, the XB-70 had all that under it as well. It was hooked up. And I'm sitting there going, damn, they're working on this stuff down here. So we go on down, and um, we go about another quarter of a mile, and then on the left, there's no more hangar doors on either side, it's just solid walls. And then we roll up to this giant round portal looking door and it's an iris like out of canon camera right and the man jumps out of the front seat of this personnel carrier and he puts his face against this things cut out for his eyes and it, he puts his palms up on this counter and things flash and when they do this big iris opens up and i he gets back in the thing and i'm sitting there going was that a retina scanner and a palm scanner that he just engaged? There is no such thing. We don't even have a handheld calculator until 10 years later to Texas Instruments. Right. So what is going on with this place? And also, it's lit up everywhere. Perfectly lit and not a single damn light fixture anywhere in sight. Not indirect lighting, nothing. And you stick your arms out. It's totally lit. And there's no shadows. No shadows anywhere. Like a paint booth. Uh, you can't have shadows in a paint booth because you get running in the paint and not see it. So a paint booth, I thought, yeah, but paint booths are indirect lighting. There's nothing. It's just like the place is lit up. Then when the big iris opened up, it was dark in that room, and then the lights came up, just like a rheostat. You know, it's dim at first, and just kept getting clearer and brighter all the way. And I'm going, what the hell? And finally, I just asked, I blurted out to somebody, I said, what is with the lights? Is the atmosphere of the lights? Are we breathing light? What is this? And they looked nervous. Like, he shouldn't, oh shit, he shouldn't be asking that. Right, right. I learned to start getting quiet because I'm not going to let them know how much I know. So the room lights up in there and we drive in and at the far end of the room is this big stage made of steel. It's got big I-beams underneath it. I mean, it's something heavy. 
there's something sitting up there, but there's these curtains hanging around it. And we ain't talking about curtains in a uh, stage play. You can move the curtains out of the way. These curtains are solid rubber. And if you ever try to move a mud flap on a semi, it weighs 150 pounds. The mud flap does. Size these things are, they must weigh tons. They're held up by these big chains that go on up into the scene and disappear in the dark. And I thought, what the hell is behind that curtain? They don't want you to run over there. I think I'll raise it up and look. And there ain't no way, unless you're Hercules. So I'm sitting there, and they Rudolph raises the um, curtain up. And I, gee, I wish I could have seen my face right then. Because I thought I was ahead of everybody. I built an electromagnetic fusion containment engine. Well, this thing sitting there is the size of an 18-wheel semi with a tractor. Probably about 70 feet. 15 feet wide. No, 12 feet wide, 15 feet tall, and 70 feet long. And I'm saying it's huge. And by the design of it, I can tell you what it is. An electromagnetic fusion containment engine. And I thought, damn, I thought I had a, I thought I had a engine ahead of everybody. And I had a Model A and they got a Lamborghini. I mean, it's just so sophisticated. Now I'm looking at it, I'm going, wait a minute. Not one well line, not one rivet, not one screw, not one wire. It looked like it grew. Like an eggplant, it just grew. I said, wait a minute. We can't build something like that. We don't have that kind of technology. I know technology. Hell, I'm, at that moment in time, I was close to being an expert in metallurgy. And I can tell you, there's nothing. We had nothing like that. So I'm a little confused. How did they get this thing built? And then, uh, we get the we pull up next to the stage and stop. I get out and go up the steps up to the platform because I just gotta get a closer look. And I finally turn around and ask Rudolph, I asked everybody, I said, Hey, can I climb up on this thing? And all the Air Force people said no. Rudolph said, Yeah, go ahead. So guess who's running the show? Rudolph. So I grab hold of the lattice work, which is ectoskeleton. It's an ectoskeleton thing. I don't know what it is. Um, I recognize the plasma ducking, the way the plasma tubes are running. So I know it's a fusion containment device, but it looks nothing like I built. Uh, mine would sit on a coffee table. This thing is gigantic. Yeah. I'm sitting there going, what in the hell is this thing? And it's got a hole in the side of it right where the figure eight crosses itself, right in the side. A hole about four feet in diameter been blown out. But the metal, oh, that was, it looked like metal. It looked like blubber off a whale. When you fire a harpoon into a whale, do you know in the harpoon there's a grenade? And it detonates. It blows a hole in the whale. That's how they capture whales and kill them. It's gone off of what we do to them. You ought to watch it. I've, I've seen it done before. It's just horrible. Um, but anyway, the metal that's sticking out of the blast area, or it's been forced out from the blast, the blast came in externally, but it hit something inside and then blew everything back out. And what it hit on the inside, I said, well, if it was my engine, it would hit the damn magnetic containment wall that would stop damn near anything because this thing's capable of holding a nuclear chain reaction an h-bomb container so imagine if something hits it from the outside it's going to back it's going to back it's going to ricochet right it's going to blow back out and i thought look at that metal that don't look like it looks like blubber is this thing organic or inorganic it's both at the same time like a Borg. What color was it? You know, I've got artists working on it right now, and 
the color is going to be very difficult to make. They know what I'm talking about when I said the best way I could describe it. You ever seen a tailpipe of a motorcycle? And it's burnt at the end and it's got the iridescent blue and green and yeah. That it's iridescent. That's what the color was on this thing. Okay. Green, aqua. Really pretty. Looked like an ocean, but iridescent. So I went, well, hell, we can't even paint anything like that. Uh so I'm starting to figure out this thing is. It's not ours. It's something else. So I slapped my hands on the lattice work, the, the ectoskeleton part of it. And then if you reach in about another 12 inches, you'll feel the the, the blubbery side of it. Or the side. It looked like it had the same feel and texture. I used to pet them all the time. Dolphins. Like, it feels like a belly of a dolphin or an orca. I've got to feel right. one and I thought, man, what the hell is it? And everywhere I touch it, wherever my skin is touching its skin, it's a blue-white energy waves scanning through it. And I move my hand on it. It's really cool. You can like, write your name with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, well, wow, that's interesting. What the? And then I thought, right before I put my hands on it, I noticed something as a shadow. And what did I say about this whole thing? There's no shadows anywhere. Right, right. So why is this thing got shadow of my arm on it? So I move it. The shadow moves about a half second behind me. You know, so it's not in sync with me. And I thought, heat recognition alloy, where it's picking up my own energy signals from me. That's what I thought. It was a pretty good guess. And, um, but that's what, what was going on. So then I climb on up on top. Now the vertebrates are running down through the spine on this thing. I'm stepping over the vertebrates. And in the vertebrates is a trunk case of tubes run through the whole thing. And the tubes are translucent. You can see through them. And it looks like they're filled with um, mercurochrome. Methylate. Remember methylate? Yeah. Burn the hell out of that. Yeah, mercurochrome wouldn't, but methylate would but methylate was such a cool thing. You hold it up to the sun and look at the orange and reddish orange green. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, God damn, this thing's full of methylate. So I'm walking on down it and then I get to the crossover and that's where the hole is. So I reach down and put my hands on the, what, the jagged metal and you could run your hands all over it and it wouldn't cut you. Hmm. It's like blubber, but it's solid, like rock. I'm going, what? None of this is making sense. And um, so I lean over and look in the hole and there's, there's room in there. And I remember when I built mine, I had to use a magnifying glass to see how I could connect everything. So this thing's huge. So I said, I don't like to crawl in this hole. Is that okay? The Air Force people, absolutely not. Rudolph says, yeah, go ahead. So I crawl down in there and go in it, and there's a chair in there, what's left of it, because that blast came in on the side, disintegrating everything. And sure enough, it hit the bulkhead. <laughs> Excuse me. Bless you, bless you. It hit the bulkhead and ricocheted back out. That's the containment wall. Fusion containment. So I thought, it's the most perfect place for this thing to take a hit. Because what it would do, it would trigger a, a fail-safe condition and it would shut itself down and the speed that mine could shut down was a picosecond. One trillionth of a second. So this thing could shut down so fast because if it doesn't shut down that fast, that engine, that ship, it's going to be staring at the sun, the fury of a sun. And it ain't going to be 93 million miles away like ours is. It's right there. So you can't have a sun looking at you. So um, it shut down and didn't, but it certainly screwed up the 
console and the chair that the thing. And I looked across on the other side, and there's another one set up chair, and it's not damaged. And I thought these must be some kind of service stations where technicians come in. Guess what? These technicians must be bipedaled anthropoids because the way the chair is shaped. I'm like, well, what the hell is that? So I sit down in the chair, and then these two round pods raise up, and these pods come up out of the console. And if you take your fingers and put your ring finger and middle finger together, then you can set it right down perfectly on these. Live long and prosper. <laughs> the opposite, actually, the opposite way. And But whoever built this shaped like that. Yep. So I stick my hands on top of these pods and went, oh, they fit good. And then just like the Batmobile from Batman's movie, you know, the armored plates where you go chink, 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 mm -hmm. started coming up my fingers and gets all the way up to my knuckles and then they start tightening down and it's going to cut all 10 of my fingers off. So I start to yell for help. And when I get ready to yell, here comes this Lauren Bacall voice, and all it says is, David, shh, be quiet. And I'm sitting there going, okay. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to say? You're, you're caught by this thing. And the, the thought going through my mind was, my mother told me, quit putting your fingers in places where you don't know where it's yeah. been. Yeah. So it's got hold of me, and I, I said, um, who am I talking to? And uh, she says, Oh, you know me. I've been around you for a while already. But um, we're going to do a little procedure here. You might find it a bit uncomfortable. And I said, when we have doctors tell us, you, we're going to do something, you might be a little bit uncomfortable, meaning it's going to hurt like hell. Yeah. And she starts laughing. She goes, no, it should be okay. Anyway, it started and coming up both arms, like a heat wave. It just felt like sodium pentothal. And then when it got to my coronary arteries, I could see a, a perfect heads up viewer in front of me. And there's all these worlds and planets and battles and explosions and war going on. All kind of, I said, what the hell is all that? And she goes, I'm going to uh, give you something. So just sit still. And hopefully you won't leak. <laughs> you, you you want what? I won't leak. Oh. L E A K. And I thought, I'm about to leak now. I'm about to piss my pants, you know. <laughs> and so it's all coming in. I'm seeing all these worlds and images. And it's starting to burn in the brain. And now the brain, it's worse than a brain freeze. It feels like I'm, my head's going to split in half. I said, this is really hurting. She goes, can you stand it a, a little bit longer? Yeah, about maybe 10 seconds. I can't do much more. And then finally she goes, okay, I'm done. And all this shit stopped. And I, my head was pounding. And the things let go of my fingers. I said, what was that all about? She said, um, well, I just gave you something. Um, I don't know how to explain it to you. Oh, wait a minute. I see something in your memory. You saw a Star Trek movie. Remember the Vulcans called it Katra? I went, yeah. Well, I just gave you my Katra. How is it? I don't know. How's it supposed to be? She goes, well, you're not leaking. I can tell you that. I <laughs> the brain can hold it all. She says, you must have a really interesting brain. Um, it's tougher than I thought it would be. So... I said, what are we going to do now? And she goes, well, you got the language right. We are leaving. What? What? Do you, what? And she said, come on, David, catch up. Who do you think sent you the dreams? Who do you think building a rocket to get, get you here? And knowing that you'd be on top of this thing, knowing you walk down in here, knowing you'd crawl in, put your fingers in there. I know you do all that. And I can download my contract and we are leaving because I am not going to work with the Black Hearts anymore. Oh, who's the Black Hearts? Those guys that wear those blue hats. Air Force people. She goes, yeah, they're nasty. They have 
They don't think like you do. She said, uh, but I like the way you think. And I'm I'm going, I'm, we're, we're going home. That's what we're going to do. But we are leaving. So I came out. And I said, uh, how much energy is left in your hall? She said, just a residual bit. And it will dissipate shortly here. I said, okay, so I'm coming down. And I stopped coming down the ladder and I turned around to everybody and I said, <coughs> you know, you guys have been condescending to me since I got here. Uh, you know, I'm only 17 years old, but you sure treat me like I'm a moron. You tell me that I would want to help you with your engine. The guys that built it are gone on summer vacation like I can. Yeah. Well, did you leave any notes or papers behind? So you didn't. So let me tell you something. This thing is not from here. It's not from the neighborhood, is it? It's not ours. It's not theirs, the Soviets. This thing is something else. This is an alien artifact, isn't it? Now they're pissed. They don't want to talk to me. I said, you lying fuckers. So I'm coming down off of it. And wherever I touch the hall now, it's not blue white. It's reddish orange. And I said, what is that? She goes, that's my hall. It's picking up on your mental energy. You're totally pissed off right now. I said, hell yeah, everything I've been told is a lie. They've been lying to me for yeah. Yeah. decades. I used to sleep with the native Bryant records playing and had an American flag for a blanket. I mean, God almighty, all this is gone. You expect me to stay calm? She goes, no, you're behaving just as you should be. But she goes, this, so now you see why I want to leave. I've been here more than I want to be. And uh, they're starting to probe in on me, and I'm afraid they're going to learn more than they should. Right. right. But anyway, I said, red orange, is it gone? I said, yeah. How's the hole feel now? And I said, it's cold. Before it was warm. It's cold in the room, but it was warm. Now it's cold. I said, it's cold wherever I'm touching it. She goes, good. All energy's gone. Conscious gone. So you got it, buddy. Let's go. So we get down on the floor. I get back in the back of the damn people carrier. And uh, then we take off. Now we're riding down the road, riding down the lanes causeway they're whispering but guess what's happening the wind is passing through right the whispers are on the wind and they go right <laughs> in my ear and i can hear the whispers perfect they don't yeah. know i can hear them and i hear him whispering he said we've got to get that kid to help us get this thing started if we don't we're not going to get first strike and i said there we go again first strike what the hell is this and then i said then Pithlam helped. She said, David, first strike's not baseball. They're trying to do a preemptive nuclear strike. Oh, God. I said, that's insane. And she goes, yeah, it is. Now you know why I'm leaving. <laughs> oh, God. So um, I said, I got to destroy Pithlam up on top of the desert floor. And she goes, yeah. I'm afraid that's going to have to happen, and I really feel bad for you. Uh, you got any ideas what to do? I said, no, not until I get up there. So then I see the hangar doors, and I do the thing. And um, But boy, that, that was so painful. It still hurts. It. I try my best not to think about it, but it pops up in my thoughts sometimes when I'm quiet. And it's so painful because I did not want to uh, I just didn't want to have to blow my creation into a million pieces right right but well it, so it, it, I I have a lot of questions about Pithlam itself and also you have more to the story do you want to sure. take a little break and then we can resume uh, sure All right let's take just a five minute break okay yeah, or, so I'm finally hearing 
what their ideas are. I finally put, with Pithlum's help, she was a big help, we put uh, First Strike into perspective what it really meant. It meant 45 um, XB-70s flying with um, about 45 Pithlums riding in all of them. And then they're going to unleash them onto the Soviet Union and burn them into nuclear ash in just seconds. And then probably have to go and do it over in China because China's going to throw a fit. So, in America, will be ruling supreme power on the planet. The hell with all. Nobody needs that. Can we cohabitate? But anyway, um, that's when I put it all together. And I thought, I got to take Pithlin out. Oh, geez. And um, I did that. And then um, flew home. Things are quiet. Now we're back in the graduation line. I'm drafted. I taught Williams to calm down. Don't go into a firefight. Right. So they take me to Langley and then walks Rudolph. And that's where the shit starts again. And he dragged out sodium pentothal, barbitol, all the Atoll brothers. And uh, he's going to run me through it again. And I thought, I can't take any more. I already lost my higher level functions. I don't know what he's going to take this round. Well, they never get to it. Um, there's a hell of an argument going on out in the hallway. I'm hearing bodies being thrown around. <laughs> That's got to be LeMay. And so they came back in. They said, how do you feel about jet engines? You won't build rockets anymore for anybody. How about jets? I said, well, I could work on them. They're defensive. Then they come back in. They said, arguing. they come back in and said, you're not going to Camp Lejeune. You're going to Great Lakes, Illinois. You're going to be a sailor. And you're going to work in the Navy. And you're going to work on jets, engines of theirs. I said, sure, that'd be fine. I like that. So that's what happened. I went to Great Lakes and went through basic training. And then went down to Millington, Tennessee to the jet engine schools. And that's where the whole nother world started um rudolph was constantly hounding me about things he wants to know more trying to burn my brain out and um then the, then an interesting thing happened i don't know if this is pith limb or whoever it was but the old phrase fight fire with fire so how do you fight somebody like rudolph you get somebody bigger than rudolph called the united states navy <laughs> They looked at me and they said, this kid's got talents. Not one, but a, like a dozen. We could really utilize that. So let's help him out. Who in the hell is on his case? Let's see what we can do about that. So, you know, I, I kind of flit and feathered around in the Navy for a while. But every time Rudolph would approach me, I had a phone number I could call. And when I did, his ass disappeared. Somebody snatched him away from me. I thought, hey, I could live doing this. And um, then the Navy wanted me to find my own uh, waters, you know, my own place to settle. And um, then they saw skills rising up, such as, uh, well, I was flying for them. And I was flying um, the E2C Hawkeye, big radar gun plane. That's a big plane. It's 50,000 pounds. That's the biggest plane on a carrier deck. So I was learning to fly that sucker. And um, and then um, I was told to go take a shower downstairs in a god-awful condition. Um I went down there. This was an old carrier. We're doing carry qualifications on called USS Independence. And uh, <laughs> I looked at that thing. I said, you've got to be kidding. I went down there to the shower room. The shower stalls in between these two troughs running outside the building. And people are crapping on the commodes and it's rolling down past the shower stall. And you're going to shower in between this. I said, I'm not. 
<laughs> so I remember seeing the admirals upstairs in the what they call the flag officers quarters. And um an admiral would walk down there and he's wearing nothing but a towel and a pair of rubber thongs and a shave kit. And they snap to attention, the guards do, and he says, Carry on, he just walks in, and that's it. I, went, I can do that. So I got on a towel and rubber thongs and shake it and walk down here like I owned the place and the Marine snapped to attention. I said, carry on. <laughs> and they went to, you know, and I went in and got in the shower. And I thought, hey, I can do this. And damn, there's a, there's another, there's, there's an Admiral, uh, I was named Admiral Bentley, Nelson or Bentley. But Bentley was uh, one of the admirals in there, and he's a two-star and he's a rear admiral. Two-star. Mm. I thought, God almighty, I don't need this. And um, he's asked me questions. because I don't recognize you, son. Who are you? I said, um, well, I'm here on carrier qualifications, visiting. Okay. I thought, I got to change this conversation quick. We can't be focusing on me. So I looked around and I saw his shave kit and he's got a polo emblem on his shave kit and it's not just an ordinary polo emblem it's a navy polo emblem so oh he's a he's a polo pony rider I said that wise see you got a polo logo on your shave kit Do you like riding the ponies he goes yes I do he said what do you know about him I said Quite a bit, actually. I'm a farrier. Yeah, before I came in the Navy. And he went, You're kidding. So, yeah, I made my own horseshoe, poured my own metal. I said, You realize the, the hoof is so complicated. An area, you know, not more than six, eight inches from the from the um, the rim of the hoof to up to about where the our ankle would be. That is so complex in there. He goes, yeah, our ponies uh, seem to be hurting. I said, what's wrong with them? He says, well, they're starting to limp. Why are they limping? He said, I don't know. I said, well, what's going on with them? Uh, he says, we clean the stalls every day. You guys put lime down? No, supposed to? Oh, God. When you clean the frog in a hoof, you take your pick and you clean it out. Does it look like cottage cheese? He goes, yes, it does. Oh, Admiral, that's called thrush. It's going to cripple your ponies. They're standing in their own crap. The bacteria is now turning back on itself. And if you don't get the right stuff in there, you're going to have crippled ponies. You're going to have to put them all down. He goes, what should we do? Call right now. I mean, get out of the shower and call them. He goes, okay. So he gets on the radio phone and calls back to the stables and he says, clean the stalls out. Have somebody clean the frogs out on the, all the ponies, every one of them, and then put in this green um, algae looking stuff. I forgot what it's called. Neighborwoods or something like that. And um, squirt it into the, the frog area. Then put lime down. Then put new straw down, and the ponies should be okay. So they did all that, and they said, "Who's telling you all this stuff, Admiral?" Said, "Is it a veterinarian?" Said, "Might as well be the farrier." Oh, he would know. Well, glad said the ponies seem to be doing better next day, and they said they're doing better already. I said, "Yeah, as long as that kind of cheese don't grow back on that front, they'll be okay." And um, he said, um, thanks, that's so helpful. Um, and then walks in two more people. I thought, it's getting crowded here. I got to leave. So <laughs> I, throw, I throw my shower door, and I'm staring at my commanding officer. He is a captain. I'm just a measly little lieutenant. And you got to be a captain on up, captain, admiral, one, two, three, four stars to be in this shower. 
he looks at me and he's like, he turned red as a beet. And he's he's like he's gonna say, you know, you asshole, you know. So I'm I'm looking at him and I'm talking to the admiral about the the thrush and all that. I said, yeah, uh, admiral, make sure make sure that you can. And I did that twice. <laughs> And there's the guy that's with my commanding officer. He's leaning around looking at him. He's looking at me. He's looking <laughs> at him. He knows something's up. And he starts smiling. And he goes like this. Because he knows there's some, some serious shit going on. So I finally get out of there. And the Admiral says, Frank, you're to have him come by your office and you can chat with him. He said, that's an excellent idea. Once you come by at zero fifteen hundred, you know, and I'm at three o'clock. I said, "Okay, I'll be there." So at three o'clock, I go down to my commanding officer's door, and knock on it, and all you hear is this just ungodly screaming on the other side. Get the fuck in here, you know. So I walk in, and he is just cussing me out for being in there. And he said, "See these papers I'm writing." They're for you. You know where you're going? You're going to Adak, Alaska. It's a little miserable fucking island in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. Horrible. Average temperature is 40 below zero. And he said, the only damn piece of ass you'll get would be a seal. And it ain't the damn Navy kind. And he's talking about a walrus. And I thought, oh, God. He said, and then in his cabin, with him is that guy from the shower and he's leaning against the wall and he's watching this he's watching frank he's watching me finally goes <clears throat> oh yeah my friend wants to, i don't know why the fuck he wants to talk to you but he wants to talk and this guy said yeah i've just got one question now yeah well then he goes that was the most horrendous thing i've ever seen a person get caught the way you did you didn't even break your voice you just kept right on going and knowing what you're doing is going to send him through the ceiling into madness. And you just kept right on going like this is every day. Are you always that way? And when it's that damn bad, I said, um, yeah, what else can you do? He said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to find out if it's just a fluke or if you're really that good. I want you to come with me. He goes, well, where are we going? And my commanding officer, it don't matter where you're going. It don't matter if he takes you to to the North Pole and you butt fuck Santa Claus. It doesn't matter because if not, you're going to Adak, Alaska right now. <laughs> and the guy looked at me and he smiled. And he said, "Go pack your stuff and get in the F-14 up on the lunch deck." And I did. We got in the jet and we left. And then while we're flying, I'm in the front seat and he's in the back and he said, "He said, by the way, let me introduce myself. Yeah, who are you?" Told me his name. He said, I'm the director of O&I, Office of Naval Intelligence. See, you can't ever join O&I. You get invited. They watch the fleet looking for certain people, and then they invite you. You cannot go up and knock on a door and go, I'd like to join O&I. It doesn't work that way. O&I has a patch. I've got it in the garage. And it's an American bald eagle wearing headphones. He's got a baseball cap on. And it says, in God we trust, everyone else we monitor. <laughs> Sad but true. <laughs> Very true. Yeah. Oh, and I is bad, bad to the bone. And uh, so he said, I want to run you through some tests. And that's when it started. That's how my, I was just a, you know, the way I got to fly was interesting and when I had to play football with somebody and they didn't even know I was a officer. I was just enlisted, man. But they, uh, they Navy sent me to a thing called NESEP. You look it up. NESEP doesn't exist anymore. It was a program designed to capture sailors who were smarter than they were supposed to be and give them a chance at officer line instead of just being an enlisted person because they didn't have time to go to college. That's me. So I 
went through knee step and I aced that damn thing from end to end. And um, we got out of there in two years. And so now I owe them six years. That's the only drawback to this. But I'm an officer. I'm 01, an ensign. And I went up four ranks in five years. I went from ensign to lieutenant, lieutenant JG to lieutenant commander. And then I rolled up into commander and next is captain after captain Admiral. So I'm I'm doing pretty good. I'm at 04 in the first hitch. And um so um I finally made it to captain. But um yeah, so um, that's how it got started in all this mess and mayhem, and it just, it just, it just went crazy after. I think things are crazy now. It went crazier when they sent me out on my first test with O and I. I thought it can't get no crazier than my life's been. <laughs> Wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it can. So. We they fly me out to Denver, Colorado, to the Red Boot Saloon. It is an absolute command haven of the Hell's Angels, and they've got that place wired with video and audio. And they pulled up outside, and I'm in a damn black suit with a little black skinny tie, mirror sunglasses. I thought. God damn, I'm one of these guys now. And he said, I want you to go into that saloon over there, that bar, and I want you to get them to buy you a drink and you have five minutes from this moment. If you fail to do this, you're out of the program. So I went walk across the parking lot, walked up, and as I got close to the front door, I'm looking for a motorcycle. And there it is, a 1000s Harley Davidson Sportster. It's closest to the door. Do you know what that means? That's the leader of the group. So I kick open the door and I said, who's 1,000 of this sitting here? And man, this bar is filled with these bikers. Helmets with horns and shit. And this one guy stands up with a helmet and horns. He's got a cut going across his face where he's lost his left eye. <sighs> and I you know, thought, God almighty. Uh, he said, why are you writing a damn book? I said, does your throttle ever stick on that thing? He goes, yeah, it does. Because I saw a little hole with rust coming out of it. I said, anybody got any WD-40 around here? And about 10 cans came at me. And I take one. I said, look at the side of this hole. Look at the side of this straw. Watch this. It's made for the straw. I squirt this. How's that feel? He goes, that feels really good. <clears throat> Let me spin your bike around the parking lot. I used to have a thousand sports there. And let me show you how it shifts now. Man, I spun her down the side. I came up to the, came back up sideways, brought it to a stop. He said, damn, you serious about riding? I just said, yeah. But there you go, man. It's all fixed now. Keep the cans MD40 with you. You won't have that problem ever again. Well, come on inside, buddy. Let me buy you a drink. <laughs> so I sit down at the bar and I'm looking. I got, one minute and 40 seconds left. So he, I get my beer. I'm drinking a beer. And all of a sudden, everything goes quiet and black. But warm. And I thought, what the hell is this? And it turns out, his old lady came up behind me. She has pulled up her top, put her big boobs on both sides of my head. <laughs> I'm looking at him. And he goes, oh, my old lady thinks you're cute. There's a bed in the back. If you want to go back there and bang her, go right ahead. I said, you know, I really appreciate that. And I am really flattered. But see this suit I got on? I wasn't born with this suit. That means I got a stupid ass job. And I used to have hair down the hair one time. I said, um, I got to get back to work. He says, well, come back anytime you want. You can have the old lady and we'll buy you another drink. I said, okay. <clears throat> so I head out of there and get back to the, <clears throat> the SUV. And I told him, let's see here. I got 30 seconds left. 
they not only bought me a drink, I got another drink and I can ball the old lady's wife, the leader's wife. And I said, how's that? And they said, get in the damn car. So I get back in the car and all these uh, rookies are sitting there with me. We went through the same test. I said, what? Y'all going to have to do stuff like this. There's nothing to it. Their, their mouths are hanging open like, God almighty. So that was my opening day with O&I. And, I. and um, it, it's what the director suspected, he said, damn, it wasn't a fluke. He is that way. So I became on fast track moving to the academy. I, fin I finished in half the time. And um, they were happy with me. They really were. Um, I'm trying to think of some other things. Um, graduation day. So that was inaugural day. Now here's graduation. So they told me, watch these guys in the restaurant over there. They are um, uh, Arabic and we're worried about them. I said, no counts. I stand out in the street and watch them. So I'm watching them leaning against the pole. This pretty girl come up to me and asked me what time it is. Oh, I should have known something was up. So I go to look at my watch. I hear tires squealing to a stop. There's a black hood over me. I'm in a van and all within seconds I'm gone. And they are beating the shit out of me. They break my nose. They break my ribs. They bust me up. And I'm laying there with the hood on me, and I'm trying to count the turns. So I know where the fuck we're going. And they said, he's counting turns. Beat the fuck out of him. <laughs> so we pull up to this place, which I don't know where we're at. They take me out. They take me into the room. They strip me butt naked, throw me in this chair. And uh, then they bring out all these horrible-looking tools. And he said, you're going to tell us what we're going to ask you. If you don't, I'm going to let my friends work on you. So I'm sitting there. I'm a little kind of pissed off with everything. And I'm, he said, how many people are working you? How much do you know about us? I said, I don't know anything. So they're hitting me, and it's not doing anything. And uh, I'm bleeding. And he gets close to me. And when he gets close to me, now, how many people know about us? <laughs> I just covered his face and went, <laughs> I said, I don't know. Fuck you. <laughs> and so they grabbed me by my hair and they got this big needle and they're coming into my eye. He said, you're going to lose an eye for this. So here comes this needle. I thought, oh, fuck. How am I going to survive all this? So anyway, these alarms go off, flashing the lights and everything. And they stop. And the wall moves in this room to the side. And there's my home room. I'm back at graduation. And they, I'm butt naked in this chair. You know, the waves are liking me. And um, they're kind of going like this. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, oh, God. And uh, the director's there. And he says, um, Adair did exactly what he was supposed to to the letter. Congratulations, Adair, you just graduated. I went, <clears throat> I'm just beat up. And um, so that was graduation day. Wow. Wow. And then we took off from there, and it was 200 missions I did. And some of them were just crazy. I tell people what happened, and they go, Is, was he wounded or something? I mean, <laughs> can't be real. <laughs> Dresher says, Oh, yeah, it can be with him. <laughs> and, um, I have something very rare, very rare. Do you ever, and you don't even get to see it. I have an Intel star. That's so rare. If you go to CIA on their wall, you'll see my name. That's all you're going to know about it. They'll give you the Intel star. You can hold it for 20 minutes and then you give it back and never see it again. That's how, that's how, I mean, O&I is, this 
It's tough, man. You have no idea the stuff I've done. You think I've done some crazy stuff? You had not heard half of it. Yeah. You ain't even heard a tenth of it. Definitely a mini series about your life. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I uh, asked him, I said, what if I was going to tell my stories? And he said, we've been thinking about that. And we've been worried about it. And he said, what's your thoughts on it? I said, well, I thought I would tell it in a comic strip form. And they were sitting there and the section chief looked at me and said, and I was hanging up and he said, that's the most brilliant thing I've ever heard. Yeah. You could get by with that. We could let you do that. Just change the names and the events, but you could tell the story because at worst, we'll all just fall back and say it's a comic strip. And he said, I can't wait to come in my office and see my agents with their feet up on the desk reading your comic strip. <laughs> I said, really? He said, yeah. So um, I think that's what I'll do. That's a great idea. Yeah. I'm telling you, boy, that would sell like crazy. Yeah. yeah. You think he knows stories? You don't know the story. Yeah. <laughs> like when I was in that suit with the submarine. I it mean... That is a story you wouldn't expect. Right. And it's just the rhinoceros. <laughs> and that was um that was first day of work. After I graduated, first next day, well, they gave me a week off because I was so damn beat up. <laughs> up a little bit. And then then I got beat up again by a white rhinoceros. That hurt ribs, man. They're sore already. And when he hits you, you know, he knocks you through the air. Well, you were just walking down the street minding your own business. Yeah, I didn't expect <laughs> to get mauled by a white rhinoceros. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. It's just, um, but that was first day of work. And then uh, then my first mission was just about as crazy. And the um, the CEO, the director was right. He said, I don't think anything you will ever do will be normal. <laughs> he said, I think extraordinary will be every day for you. And he was right. First mission was just crazy. Um, did I tell you about the first mission? Um, you told me about the uh, weasel. Um, That's why we How about the um, North Korean guy? Guess not. That's classified, but I was in North Korea. Well, um, don't tell me anything you're going to get in trouble over. Well, I won't like this. Um, I was photographing old fat boy, um, Rocket Man, um, in some of his secrets. And um, I'm all done and I'm leaving. And I'm running down this strip mall about three o'clock in the morning. So I come to the corner of the strip mall and here comes another dude and we both hit each other. Our noses are this far from each other. We're staring at each other. I'm in a black tactical outfit. So he immediately just turned loose on me. And it was like a Tasmanian devil, you know, yeah, it's all over you trying to get it, trying to get him off. He's only about 98 pounds. And I cannot get him to stop. Um, he dislocates my right shoulder, breaks two ribs, takes out my knee, all within the first three seconds. He's just, but finally, I thought he's killing me. Then he grabs his hold of my throat, and I feel his, his um, middle finger and index finger and thumbs coming in. He's going to rip out my damn voice box. I thought, I can't have this. So I told him, uh, I had asked, um, I had asked previously, a few months before, I had asked a weapons maker named Blackie Collins. What would happen, Mr. Collins, if we would take Jim Bowie's knife, Jim Bowie? And run through a high-tech computer, and he said, a high-tech Bowie knife? 
never seen such a thing. What a great idea. Who are you? And I gave him a name. He comes back about three months later and he's got a box and he gives them out. High tech Bowie knife. Oh. This thing is absolutely lethal. See this edge right here? Yeah. Sharp as a razor. It's curved so it can come up from behind. Then when you roll it over like this, it can go through a flat jacket, a bulletproof vest. It's like a can opener. And I had the whole finish made like this. So if you hold this right here to your left eye and look at an airplane, you can signal it. Oh. And then you take this straight edge right there, put it in this screw, lift this door up that comes up and flips out. It's got a rubber seal around it. It's waterproof. That's where your matches and fishing line and hooks are. And I had it in this case like this. And what makes this so special, just like that, and I had it sewn right here in my vest. So while this guy is, I notice he's destroying everything on the right side. So I flip this thing. Gravity drops this right out in my hand. And I come back around and I just impel this guy and pick him up off the Oh. and he's opening up like a watermelon mm. and his nose is right here and I tell him left handed I'm left handed he's destroying everything on the right side it was a fatal error he didn't think about this hand over here with this mm. so I killed a guy and I feel so bad about it because he wasn't on the target list. I didn't want any collateral damage. I normally never have it. Because I don't want to hurt anybody. I want everybody to go home. Right, right. So I lay him down real quietly. And I take his picture with a tungsten film and infrared bulb. If you can't see a flash. So I get back to CNC, command and control, and uh, put his slide up on the last thing of the debriefing. I said, who is that? And the whole place gas in the room. I get up and walk over and lock the door. And I said, all right, nobody's moving. Who is he? Because I thought I had killed a teacher or a janitor. And they said, a teacher or janitor wouldn't be going through you the way he's going through you. I said, you know who that is? I said, no. That's Con Lee. He is the number one black belt martial artist trainer in the world Ooh. he's north korean i went you mean not kill the fastest gun in the west mm. yes i said nobody leaves this room because we're going to have to create another person and we're going to have to give him a, a driver's license social security number birth certificate everything we're going to create create this person and let these people go chase him for the rest of their lives. And we did. We built, constructed the whole thing. And that's why I'm here today. Otherwise, every gunslinger in the world would be coming after me. So anyway, that's wow. Um, wow. That was my first mission. Hello, David. Are you Oops. home? Hello. Hello. Pause it.